morning. Last week in our reading, we heard the story of God calling David to be king. After a long reign as king, David's son, Solomon, becomes the next king. Solomon's goal is to build a house for God, which is the temple in Jerusalem that the people had been waiting for. We read from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house in my name. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You did so well answering questions that I thought I would start with a quiz this morning. There's only one question, don't worry, and it's a group quiz. There's a line in a movie, if you build it, they will come. What movie is that from? Field of Dreams, exactly. That's a 1989 movie about a man who builds a fantastic baseball stadium in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa. And in the movie, he builds it, and these baseball greats come. Major League Baseball reprised that movie this summer and held a game there between the White Sox and the Yankees, and people came. I was thinking about that movie this week because it's the end of the October and it's the World Series. Our own Minnesota Twins have recently wrapped up their season at Target Field. Now, <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a joke, but <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe it was this year, but there's always next season. As you know, they have not always played at Target Field. And in fact, they have not always been the Minnesota Twins. Before moving to Minnesota in 1961, what was the name of the team? The Washington Senators, exactly. And where did they play when they first came? Met Stadium. Met Stadium. You guys, those are the bonus questions. You're doing really, really well. Raise your hand if you ever went to a game at Met Stadium. It looks like a lot of this crowd did. And we probably thought that stadium would last forever. But then came the Metrodome in 1982. And the beauty of an indoor stadium was there would be no rain delays, there would be no game cancellations, there would be no freezing when it was cold and boiling when it was hot. And there was this operating agreement between three teams who could share the space, the Twins, the Vikings, and the Gophers. And yet, that stadium didn't last forever either. I raise this today because we are thinking about buildings. In our text that Carol just read for us, Solomon was determined to build this temple for God. Going back a little further in history, God people really, really wanted a human king like other people had. And God finally capitulated and gave them first King Saul and then King David 
and then David's son, Solomon. David wanted to build a grand temple for God. He did not think it was fair that he lived in this gorgeous house built of cedar wood. Well, God and the box containing the Ten Commandments called the Ark of the Covenant lived in a tent. That just seemed wrong. But God said, no, he did not need a temple. And as Solomon said, his father was too busy fighting wars and doing other king-like things to build a temple. So he was determined to do so. And that is exactly what he did, building a temple in Jerusalem. It had been much awaited. It could be the center of their faith, a house of God. And in his prayer of dedication, he said that it would stand forever. But as we know, it didn't. After it was destroyed, a second temple was built. And when Jesus was living in Jerusalem at that time, it was built of great big stones. And people thought it would be there forever. But Jesus said that even those stones would crumble. Today, we celebrate Reformation Sunday. And 500 years ago, or just more than 500 years ago, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 complaints or theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, this sounds a little strange to us, but it was actually a common practice in the day. Putting things on the church door was kind of like a community bulletin board and meant to start discussion among people. Luther did not intend to start a new church. He just saw that the church had kind of gone astray and was not focusing on God and its core principles anymore. There was too much of human creation, human sin, involved in the church. One of his greatest complaints was something called indulgences. Now the Pope wanted to build a great big grand cathedral called St. Peter's in Rome. And he was charging large sums of money to the people in Germany to pay for this very far away cathedral. One of the ways was called indulgences. You see, people at that time were very, very worried that they were so sinful that they or their relatives would not get into heaven. And thus, the church would sell them these indulgences, which would shorten the time for their loved ones to be in purgatory and move them on to heaven. Now, you couldn't not buy those, could you? It is probably the best fundraising scheme in the history of the world. But it's terrible theology because as we know, you can't buy your way into heaven. Jesus did that for us. Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. And through the waters of baptism, we are made part of God's family. We are loved and forgiven sinners we will spend eternity in heaven with God. It is not our own doing. It is God's grace. That, just like the building of the temple, was a time of turning a major point in human history. And we, too, gather together in a building. I'm not saying that beautiful buildings in honor of God are a bad thing. Look at the high ceilings and the organ pipes, the candles and the pyramids, our cross and our baptismal font, the elements for communion, our blue wall that symbolizes the earth, the water and the sky, God's creation, the stained glass windows, these are all things that help us as we gather together to focus our worship on God, our creator. This built place where we gather to worship, 
to sing, to learn, to connect with one another, to pray, to grow. But sometimes we confuse our identity as God's people with a building. And that balance is what has been problematic for humans over the years. Is the church a building? As you said, that's kind of a trick question. We are grateful for this building that allows us to gather together as a congregation. It is a tool for ministry. It is also a place where the daycare Caterpillar Learning Center gathers each weekday and we have made space for them. And during the pandemic, we were very careful to give them space so they could gather safely for their staff and their students. And for the other community groups that also gather in this building, which is a tool for ministry. But we don't want to confuse this tool with the purpose of the church, which is relationship with God and one another. We are called to love God and to love one another. The last year and a half has been another major turning point in history. When the church buildings were closed, but the church itself was alive. We didn't gather in a building, we gathered online. We gathered out of doors. So does it mean people who gather in a building as the church? Or does it mean the body of Christ who come to worship together in community and then go out into the world to love our neighbors, to serve God? That is the core of who we are as God's people. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us a building as a tool for ministry. Help us not to confuse the building with our identity. Help us to know that our identity is in you through our baptism. We are made part of your family forever. Amen.